thirties. <laughs> yeah, thirties really old. Hey. So old. <laughs> um, yeah, so loads of stuff to do today, right? Um, the sort of main kind of goal at the end of today is so that you can understand, um, I guess, how kind of BGE takes something which is just a set of vertices and ends up rendering that to the screen and how everything kind of is linked together in, in a scene. So there's a couple of things that we need to know in order to do that. So the first thing, we're going to finish off the maths, right? I'm just going to briefly run through the vector stuff that we went through from the last day. And then the next kind of bit of, I suppose, what's called linear algebra is understanding uh, matrices. So once we understand ve vectors and matrices, we can understand the thing called the rendering pipeline. Rendering pipeline. I have some notes on this, uh, which I might end up using some of the PowerPoint slides and notes and stuff today. So um, the rendering pipeline is basically looking at how we take a set of vertices which are in the local space of the object and end up rendering them as a 2D uh, thing on the screen, which is called rasterization. And then we can also look at basic sort of vector operations that we need to perform in games. For example, how to implement walking, how to implement strafing, how to implement uh, yaw, pitch and roll, things like that. And yeah, then I, I kind of want to move on. This is sort of the plan and we'll get, get to it today if we can. If not, we'll get to it next week. Is looking at basically how BGE kind of takes the sort of model of matrices and vectors and the rendering pipeline and everything and organizes that into classes. So you can sort of construct a scene. And so we're going to talk about components. And um, I'm probably going to get you guys to look at some code today as well and try and come up with your understanding of what the code does. There's a few particular things that are kind of interesting to look at that I think will help you to understand how you can organize all of this stuff in terms of like a set of C++ classes which, which manage the things in the game. So we'll talk specifically about components and how VGE uses components to kind of link things together. So that's, that, that's kind of the plan for, for this thing. But once we're finished with all of that, by the way, the next thing we're going to look at is the kind of final sort of important bit of maths, which is what are called quaternions. Uh, and we certainly won't get to quaternions today, but we should get to the next week or the following week. Okay, so that's kind of the plan for today. So the first thing then, let's talk about vectors and trigonometry and stuff. The stuff you guys need to know um, just needs to be right, very clear in your heads at this stage. You need to be very clear on, um, obviously, coordinates and trigonometry. Okay, so trigonometry being sine, cosine, and tangent, and how you use that to calculate angles. Inverse sine, inverse cosine, inverse tangent. All right, the next thing then that we need to be clear about is how to use Git. Um, so how to basically create a Git project, how to create the repository, clone the repository, fork, pull requests, all of that kind of stuff, right? So probably not gonna go through Git again, because I actually have a really good video from it was about two weeks ago. And then also uh, Paul Doyle has produced a very good Git video as well. So I'll just refer you to those, and you gotta read the first three chapters in the manual, and do some Git stuff and you'll be fine. And um, the other thing then, you need to be very clear on how the vector stuff that we did last week works, and also the C++ fundamentals. So how to create classes in C++, what header files are, what CPP files are, how to set up dependencies in Visual Studio, um, and how we do memory management in, in uh, BGE, which is by using shared pointers. So that's the stuff. If you want to take a couple of notes, if you want to take a note of, like this is the stuff I'm just going to say, this is all the stuff we've done so far on this course, but this is the stuff that you'll need to know. And if you're not too sure on any one of these issues, I'm not sure if we've got time to go through them in the class, but take the time to go and figure out all of that stuff between now and next week, okay? That's all the stuff you need to know. So um, let's talk about vectors then, right? So the class that we use to manage, uh, we'll say vectors in C++ in this course, what's the class that we use and what's the library that we use? Um, we use the GLM library. What does GLM stand for? So OpenGL stands for just Open Graphics Library, and then GLM just stands for Graphics Library Maths. So it's OpenGL Maths Library. Um, so that's a library, it's a header file only library. Everything is in the namespace, GLM, colon, colon. So what are the classes that we use to do vectors in GLM? Vector. We use Vec2s for 2D vectors, and we use Vec3 for 3D vectors. All right, so a Vec3 has got, um, a Vec3 has got three components, got an X, Y, and a Z component. Give me an example of where we would use a vector in a game. Position. Yeah, cool. Why do we need a vector for a position? Why don't we just use a position object, which just has three components? What's the significance of the fact that it's a vector? We have tools to work with vectors. Yeah, 
so what are the things that we need to do with vectors? In other words, why are why vectors are not just three-dimensional strokes? New operation. So what are the operations that we typically perform with vectors? And give me an example of something that you might need to do in a game that would require you to do vectors. We can subtract vectors from each other. So okay, so we can add vectors and subtract vectors. Now just very quickly for some revision, how do I subtract one vector from another? If you want to write some code to do it or just understand the principle of it, how does it work? So you take the x component of one vector from the x component of the other vector, and then that gives you the x component of the resulting vector. You do the same for the y's, the same for the z's. Um, so in other words, subtracting and adding vectors, you get back another vector. vector. Okay, so that's adding and subtracting vectors. So you get back a vector. So, and what else can we do? Dot product. Even before we get to that, what's the next sort of like just in terms of the sequence of things you need to know about vectors? Oh, you can multiply by a scalar. You can multiply a vector by a scalar. So hopefully now you understand why sometimes floats are referred to as scalars. They're just, they're, they're, what, what does a scalar do when you multiply a vector by scalar? What does it do? It scales it up. It scales the vector. All right. So that's scalar multiplication. Scalar multiplication means multiplying each component of the vector by a single number. What do you get when you multiply a vector by a scalar? Do you get another vector or do you get a scalar back? Get vector. You get a vector back, all right? So what has changed about the vector when you scale it and what's the same about the vector? The length changes, the angle is the same. The length changes, but the direction of the vector stays the same. If you were to take something like, um, this is a 2D vector, if you take that and you essentially take each one of these positions here, and you multiply it by five, you know what you get is you multiply each x component by five and you multiply each y component by five, it will have the effect of making a big square like this. And if you wanted to try that as an experiment, you can try it out. That's what scaling a vector means. It means multiplying each of the components of the vector by a single number. And it has the effect of, you can see that each of these is exactly the same, you know, they're on the same axis, you know, back from zero. Because I've essentially scaled each one of these, so I've made them bigger without actually affecting, if you like, the direction of the vector. So the, what, when, even when I'm talking about the direction of a vector, what does that mean? What does the direction of a vector mean? From the origin. What's that? From yeah, it means the line that you draw from the origin to the vector. Right? That's called the direction of the vector. So if I was to pick a vector, you know, which is going to be down here somewhere, the direction of that vector is that direction. Sometimes vectors are relative to the origin, and sometimes vectors are relative to some other point in the scene. And that depends on the context, it depends on the problem you're trying to solve. So if I'm saying that a character has a direction vector, so I'm saying this character is pointing in a particular direction, I'm not talking about it from the origin in that case, I'm talking about it from the character's position. You know what I mean? So for example, if I had like a 2D scene like this, and I have my character drawn in like this, when I said that this character is pointing in the zero, one direction, it doesn't mean that I've moved the character to the origin and I've rotated it something like this. It means that the character is actually rotated in the zero, one direction relative to its center. itself. Right? It's relative to itself as opposed to relative to the origin. So when I talk about direction vectors, that's what I mean. They're always relative to something. Okay? So um, given two position vectors, how would you calculate a direction vector? If I was to say that I have two position vectors, if I have this position vector A and I have this position vector B, how would I find the vector that, that, that basically tells me what direction I need to go in A to get to B? What do I normalize them and then? Yeah, what do I normalize? And what do I add and what do I subtract? If I want to get a direction vector which tells me the direction from A to B. You get vector C, don't you? Yep, and how do I calculate C? What's that? B minus A. So I take the vector B minus A, and that gives me the direction vector that it brings me from A to B. If you're not too clear on that point, think of a very simple example. Think about addition and subtraction. If I have the scalar 10, and I want to go from 8 to 10, how do I do that? I take 10, and I subtract 8 from it, and that gives me, the vector. That gives me a scalar 2. So if I go from 8 to 10, I add 10 minus 8. So that's called a direction vector. And the same thing here, if I want to a vector which brings me from A to B, I take the vector B minus A. Similarly, if I wanted to go from, from um, B to A, I would just do the, the, the calculation in the opposite direction. So I take the vector A and subtract B. So B minus A is going to give me this vector, and A minus B will give me a vector 
which is the same length, but it just goes or points in the opposite direction. It's like, okay, but everybody, so I can subtract them. And that leads us to a couple of other properties of vectors that you might remember from last week. So I've got my scalars, I can add and subtract vectors, I can calculate a direction vector by just taking one position vector and subtracting the other position vector from it. Now the two other things, first of all, direction vectors normally have a length of what? Uh, they normally have a length of one. And we'll discover lots of reasons why we want to normalize vectors. You know, typically we'll be making things like look vectors and forward vectors and white vectors. And when we want to do calculations to do walking and strafing and jumping and stuff, we'll require vectors which are of direction one, which we can multiply by a scalar to scale them. So if I was to take my position and want to travel at five units per second in a particular direction, how would I do that? What do I do to my position to move in a particular direction at five units per second? Just in, in, in maths or code, what does it look like? You would take position equals position plus direction speed, oh, yeah, multiplied by the direction vector. So the direction vector we usually call it. In BG, I call them look vectors. Is that clear? So that's where you're taking a normal vector, which is of length one. You multiply a scalar, which is the speed, and then you add that to the position. Is that okay with everybody? We'll do physics in about two weeks as well. That's the thing we do after quaternions, Newtonian physics. So we look at um, acceleration and force and position and time and the relationship between all of those things. So we can make things move around in particular directions at particular speed. So a direction vector, how do I make a direction vector? Then if I was to take B minus A, I want to make a proper direction vector out of that. How do I make a direction vector out of it? Normalize it. Normalize it. So to normalize it, the steps involved, first of all, we calculate the, uh, yeah. the length of the vector. I'm not interested in the angle. The angle is, you know, the angle is something that we can we can go back to if we need to get an angle vector. But we can take the, by the way, you guys should be taking your own notes. I have loads of notes on this, but if you make your own notes, you'll remember them much better, right? Or maybe you know all this. You know all this? We did it all last week. But it's really important. It's so important. This is the fundamental things. If you read that blog post that I shared on the, um, did I share it on the Facebook page or did I just put the link up? You put it in the notes. What's that? Put it in the lab notes. I put it in the lab notes. Okay, so that's, the, you should read those blog posts. It basically brings you all the way from vectors up to matrices and those are the relationship. You literally cannot do anything in games. You're literally, you know, it's like not knowing how to code, not knowing how to do vectors. All right, it's so fundamentally important that you understand this in order to be able to do absolutely anything in games. For your final year project, for this course, you know, this is the most important stuff. This is so like the ground level stuff that everybody needs to know, right? So a direction vector, what we typically do in that example there, I can take B minus A to calculate the vector that brings me from A to B. And then if I want to normalize that, I just divide by the length of b minus a. And that just means that I calculate the length of the vector, and I divide the x component by the length, and I divide the y component by the length, and that way I end up with a vector which is of length 1. There are certain vectors for which we cannot, we cannot normalize. What vector cannot be normalized? Zero, zero. The zero vector. Why can't we normalize the zero vector? Because we can't divide by zero. The length of the normal vector is zero, so there's no way to normalize it. You can't make something which is of length zero into something which is of length one. It doesn't have a direction. Does everybody understand that? So, just in terms of maths, what does it mean to calculate the length of a vector? How do I calculate it? If I have a vector A, which is a 2D vector with an x and y component, how would I calculate the length of it? Hello. How do I calculate the length of a vector A, which has got an x component and a y component? Mathematically, you know, what's the equation? Oh, a square root of x squared plus yes, y squared. Yes, exactly. So it's a scalar. You just take ax squared plus bx squared, and then you get the square root of it. And that gives you the length of the vector. The length of the vector basically being the distance from the origin to the vector. If you take a vector 0, 5, what's the length of that? 25. The length of the vector 0, 5 will be... Five. All right, so it's basically the square root of five squared, which is going to be five. So zero squared plus five squared is twenty-five. You take the square root of that, and you get five. So that's what it means to calculate the length of a vector. And it's intuitively, you can, it's obvious. Zero and five has to be of length five. So the distance from zero zero to zero five is five. So I can move five units on the y-axis. So that's the length of the vector. And then to normalize the vector, you just divide each component by the length, and that gives you the normal of a vector. 
So, in terms of code, we have a few things that we can do. I'll leave those there so I don't forget where we're going with this. C++ being the language that supports operator overloading, to add and subtract vectors, we just use plus and minus on the vectors. And you can write it out as you would with a piece of maths. You can add in vectors, it's just a matter of going C equals A plus B, and it will do the addition as an operator overloading. We did operator overloading in C sharp, didn't we? So it's the same thing in C++, right? I've overloaded that, so it'll actually call a member function to do the uh, operation. To uh, get, calculate the length of a, a vector, how do I do that? code. And again, these are things that I would expect everybody. So if you're writing an exam question, and I've written your exam by the way, so if you're writing an answer in the exam, if you're writing an answer in an exam, you can write it in pseudo code or in English or whatever, but I would certainly expect everybody to know these, and I've done these APIs so often that they're just in your brain. You know how to do them, okay? So the API for calculating the length of a vector is GLM colon colon length, right? And you pass in the vector a, you will say, and that returns you a scalar f. So it will return you the float, which is basically the size of it. To normalize, glm, colon colon, normalize. And you pass in a, and it will return you. It doesn't modify a, it returns you a new vector, which is this which has been normalized. So there's the simple things we can do with vectors. The next thing that we did last week, if you remember, was uh, we looked at a property of vectors, a property or a op mathematical operation which, which we can perform in vectors, which is called the dot product. And I said that the dot product, at first look, you might think the dot product is a rather useless thing to do with two vectors. It's to multiply the x's together, multiply the y's together, and you get back a, you get back a scalar here. You get back a scalar, right? So if I take a dotted with b, what that is basically the same as saying is a dot x multiplied by b dot x plus a dot y multiplied by b dot y and if there's a third component you get a dot z multiplied by b dot z and that multiplies it all together you get all of this back at the other side you get a float you get a scalar back at the other side and we said that the reason why this is the, you know one of the more important things you can do with two vectors is because if you can use this to calculate the angle between two vectors by using this equation here Theta equals the inverse cosine of a dotted with b over the length of a times the length of b. And if a and b are normal, normal vectors, that means their lengths are 1, so we're just multiplying or dividing by 1 on, the, on this side here. And in that case, then we don't actually need to do the, this division bit here, because we're just, both our, we're just dividing, our, dividing by 1, which is the same as the number. So this is a really, really cool thing, and we realize that we can use this to solve lots of different problems. For example, in the lab, you know, um, maybe if I rub this to out here. Well, in here, right, that could you write the multiply of an x rather than a dot? No. <laughs> so it's just for today. Sorry? Just for today. Oh, sorry, I thought you meant in code. No, when you're writing that, could you put it as an x, because I keep looking at it, what's the dot? Uh, yeah, sure thing. Yeah, it's just that I didn't want to confuse between the x component and the multiply by symbol, but no props. Maybe I'll write it as a star. Or yes. Just, yeah, sure thing. So that dot thing there is like an asterisk, okay? So that means multiply by. So anyway, um, we never need to write this typically because usually we can write glm colon colon to get the dot product. Dot. dot. And then you go uh, a comma b, and that will calculate the dot product. In interesting question. Can the dot product ever be negative? Yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 You reckon? Yeah. Explain. Is, is that not how we calculate whether something was in front or behind? Yeah. Nope. Can the dot product itself ever be negative? If it's negative, your A and B are backwards in the dot product, right? Um, well, think about it. Just like look at the actual equation. The actual equation for the dot product is multiply the two x's together, multiply the two y's together. Well, no. Depends on what are the two vectors are once. Yeah, I think it can be negative. Yeah, it can be negative. That means that one has to be close and one has to be x. 
second. Yeah, it, it can be negative. Sorry, I was getting slightly confused there. I was thinking for a second when you take a multiplied by a, but of course if you have two vectors, then one of them could be positive, one of them could be negative. So of course you can have a negative dot product, I think, probably. Anyway, GLM call call dot is how you is how you do it in, in maths. And then the other bit of this is uh, GLM colon colon a cos. Now, of course, there's cos built into math.h. You know, from C, you might have remembered this from first year or whatever. But we use the, a, the, the GLM maths library for all of our maths in, in BGE. So we go GLM colon colon a cos, GLM colon colon dot, a comma b, and that will tell me the angle between two vectors. So here's the thing that people often get confused by, right? If I look at a little scenario like that, and I take a and I take b, if I was to get the dot product of those two vectors, the angle that I get is in fact this angle here. So sometimes if I say A is looking in this direction and I want to know is B behind A, so let's, let's call this one A and let's call that one B. And I want to know if B is behind or in front of um, A. Sometimes people will do the dot product between A and B. Does that tell you anything useful? The dot product between A and B. Is it a useful thing to calculate in terms of knowing what the angle, like is, is A in front of or behind B? If I do the dot product of A and B, is that a useful thing? Does it tell me anything useful? No, is the answer. For those of you still thinking, sometimes people do that when they're not too confused. And if you do that in the exam, you'll get zero marks. All right, because it's a fundamental kind of thing that you need to just nail right here and now. If I want to know if A, if B is behind or in front of A, what's the thing I calculate the dot product between? C. So what's C? So I take C is going to be equals to? B minus A. C is going to be equals to B minus A, okay? And then what's the other thing I used to do the calculation? I think you have to normalize C and then get the A cos of C. The A cos of C. So C is a vector. You can't get a, an inverse oh, cos yeah, of a vector. We need to know the direction in which this, this A is pointing, and we call that the look vector for A. So what you're actually calculating is, and here's a way to think about this if you're not too sure about it, right? I want to know, there's the look vector. So like that's, that's kind of like, if that's looking straight up, then what I'm kind of looking to see is if B is behind or in front of, of this plane here, or this line that I've drawn across there, do you see that? That's what I'm actually looking to find out, right? If I get A dot product from B, it doesn't tell me anything useful whatsoever. What I'm really looking for is this angle here. And I can say that if this angle is greater than 90 degrees, then B is going to be behind A. And if that angle is less than 90 degrees, B is going to be in front of A. So the angle that we're calculating here is basically C, which is going to be B minus A, which tells me what this vector here is, and the look vector. Does everybody see that? Is everybody 100% clear on that? That's how you do your in front of and behind calculations. You take the vector B minus A, and you dot product it with what we call the look vector the direction vector of um, the vector A, and then that will tell you if you like the angle. And then we don't need to actually go and calculate the angle, because I know that when I do my dot product thing, and I know certain things about um, inverse cosines, if I was to do this calculation and I discovered that the, the dot product of this vector C, and we'll call it L, if I take L and I dot product it with C, and I get an answer of zero, what does that mean? It means it is exactly 90 degrees, because the cosine of 90 is zero. It's exactly 90 degrees angle. It means that that's the direction A is looking, and that is where B is. So that angle there is exactly 90 degrees, okay? Because the cosine of 90 degrees, sorry, the cosine of 90 degrees is equal to zero. All right? What happens if I do L and dot product it with um, C, and I get an answer which is, uh, less than zero. What does that mean? What angle? It means the angle is greater than 90 degrees, right? So if you if you do that and you do the dot product of those two vectors, you <coughs> discover that it's just it's greater than it's less than zero. Alright? So therefore if it's less than zero, that means the angle between those two vectors is um, greater than 90 degrees. So therefore I can say that the vector B is behind where A is. And then similarly if I discover that it's greater than zero that means the angle is less than 90 degrees, and therefore I can say that it's in front. So that's vector dot product is really cool for you because you can do those in front of or behind calculations without actually calculating the angle. So you're just 
you don't have to do an inverse cosine, all you have to do is multiply. It's just a multiplication and addition, which is a really, really fast way to do that calculation. Is everybody clear on that? Yes. No stupid questions. Dot product. Huh? Dot product. Dot product means that we multiply the x's together and we add them to the y's multiplied together. So that's the equation for dot product. It's basically a dot x multiplied by b dot x plus a dot y multiplied by b dot y. And in code, we write it as GLM colo colo dot. You pass in the two vectors, it will calculate it and return the value for you. All right. So, but just in terms of efficiency, this whole thing can be done without actually calculating any angles at all. We just do the dot product, which is just multiplication and addition. Is that okay with everybody? So now I can do an in front of or behind calculation. The next calculation that we used this for last week was the field of view calculation. So the field of view calculation requires that we calculate the actual angle. So the field of view calculation is, is like this. I have a vector A which tells me the position of something in in space, I have a look vector for A which tells me in which direction that object is pointing. So if this was like a spaceship, it could be like this. Like spaceship, guns at the front there. You get the idea. And this thing can say has got some sort of a field of view like this. Field of view could be 90 degrees, which means I see 45 degrees either side. So let's say 45 degrees there, 45 degrees there. I have some other character which appears on the scene. This is located at position B. And I want to know, can A, C, B or not? So this calculation is very similar to the previous one, but you can see that in this calculation, I draw my line up there, and what I want to see is I want to see if this angle here is greater than 45 degrees, so half the field of view. And if it's greater than 45 degrees, it means it's outside the field of view. So this we can calculate as going to be B minus A, and we'll normalize it, right? So I'm just going to go C equals B minus A. How you'd write this mathematically is just go C uh, equals C divided by the length of C. So that, that, that symbol where you've got these two um, height things, which is what you call the code, basically means the length of C. So that means C is normalized now, okay? So I have the vector B minus A, which is this vector. I have the vector C then, which is just the normal for that. And then I take the dot product. So I can call this um, dot is going to be equal to the dot product of the look vector and C. And then I take the um, inverse cosine of that theta. It's going to be equal to the A cos of the dot thing that we previously calculated. And then I can say if theta is less than the field of view, or a field of view divided by 2, it's inside the field of view. And if theta is greater than it, it's outside the field of view. So that was the um, problem I got you guys to work on in the lab last week. Everybody happy with all of that? Cool. So, um, how many people completed the lab? That's kind of nearly everybody. Is there, is there, shall I go through my solution really quickly? Or is there any point? You can look at it. I'll go through it really quickly. Let's throw it up. And then we'll do the next thing, okay? So, I'll just put it up really quickly and just very quickly go through it, okay? Just to show you how I did it, just in terms of the code that I wrote. So, you get used to writing this type of uh, code. So here's the first thing, in range or not in range, just to show you. So I have these two guides, you know, ship one and ship two. There's a transform object which contains all the information about its position and its look vector. So first of all, I make the two ship two, which is like my C vector. And this is basically equals to this ship's position minus this ship's position. Next thing I do is I check the length of that vector. Check to see if it's less than 5, because that was the distance that I need to check. But if it's less than 5, it means I'm in range or not in range. So the next one then is in front of or behind. And in front of or behind, um, next thing I do is to take my 2 ship 2 vector and I normalize it. Then I get the dot product of the 2 ship 2 vector and ship 1's look vector. So this is exactly the, you know, the problem that we just read on the board. And then I check to see if the dot is less than zero. If it's less than zero, it means I'm behind. If it's greater than zero, it means I'm in front. Because that means the angle between them is less than 90 degrees. So then the field of view is almost, you know, the next stage. I just get the angle, which is uh, the inverse cosine of the dot product. And um, half the field of view. Uh, 
uh, in this case, I think I set a 45 degree field of view. So I take radians. GLM colon colon radians converts from degrees to radians, because all these calculations are in radians. And uh, if the angle is less than half the field of view, then it means I'm inside. So that's just the, the, you know, in code, that's kind of what it looks like, the problem that we just um, solved. All right, so that, that's, that's basically for uh, last Tuesday lab. Is that okay with everybody? For the first bit, did you want us to do it in Max or just call the all? Oh yeah, just call the yaw. Yeah, because actually, um, it's kind of encapsulated the actual. And anyway, we haven't done that, but we'll we'll talk about the yaw pitch and stuff um, later on in the class, because that's kind of the next thing. It's explaining how those operations actually work. I'll show you. So um, I'm going to rub all this stuff out, and then I'm going to show you another cool property of vectors, right? Another cool thing that you can do with vectors. property of vectors and it's called the cross product. And the cross product of two vectors looks like this. If I've got an A vector and a B vector, the cross products, by the way, only work in three dimensions. They do not work in two dimensions. You can't get the cross products of two two-dimensional vectors. So if I go C equals A crossed with B, First thing that you get back here is you get a vector rather than a scalar. When we did the dot product, we got a scalar back. When we do the cross product, we get a vector back, right? And here's what happens. What you basically take is you take u and v u. So the, the components are going to be um, uh, a dot y multiplied by b dot z minus a dot z multiplied by b dot y. Yeah, that's the first component of the vector. The second component of the vector is a z b uh, x minus a x b z. And the third component of the vector is a x b y minus a y b x. And that gives you the cross product of two vectors, another way of multiplying two vectors together. So, let me give you two vectors, and I'm going to ask you to calculate the cross product of these two vectors, and if you can then maybe try and figure out what is the point of the cross product. Okay, so here's two vectors for you. I'll give you a couple of simple ones, right? Take this vector, um, 1, 0, 0, and 0, minus 1, 0. And get the cross product of those two vectors and tell me what you get. Do it on pen and paper there yourself. So, right? the first vector, yeah. First vector, what way does it point? Which axis does it point down? So, this points down the x axis, okay? Because this is x, y, z. If you're to plot this in 3D space, that's the z axis there. By the way, this is being OpenGL. Which way did we discover the z axis goes? Negative or positive? Like, does the z axis stick out of the screen or does it go away from the screen? positive z-axis, which way does it go? Stick out of the screen or go behind the screen? Did we discover this in the lab last week? So he yeah, 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 yeah. 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 Did we figure it out? No, no. it's... I don't know if it's good, but it's different. Okay, I'm pretty sure the negative z-axis goes... The positive z-axis goes this way, and the negative z-axis goes away from the screen. I think that's pretty much it. But I've used OpenGL and DirectX and X and A, and they, they flip, you know, so one uses one thing. What do you think, Simon? Well, the one I use, Z goes away. The Z goes away from the... Positive Z goes away from the camera. Goes away from the camera. So from the origin, does it go positive or negative, or does it matter? Um, it does matter, yeah, it's, it's, they're different. I think it goes away from the camera as well. Uh, in other words, it goes, like, positive Z axis is this way. Okay, we can try a few things. I, I, I thought it was the other way around, but I could be wrong, okay? Anyway, um, yeah, this one here. So we've got 1, 0, 0. Which way does that point? That points along the positive x-axis, so that points that way. Then we've got 0, minus 1, 0, so that's going to point that way. And then I have 0, 0, minus 1. So let's assume, and I'll stand to be corrected on this, that that's going to point away from the screen, away from the, the board, off into the z-axis there. What's the significance of those three vectors? What's the angle between them all? Yeah, 
They're all 90 degrees away from each other, right? So here's the thing about the cross product. This actually works for any set of two vectors. If you give two vectors and you get the cross product of it, you will get a third vector which is mutually perpendicular to the first two vectors. It's always going to be perpendicular. So given in a computer game, if you have the forward vector for something, in fact, I'm not going to tell you. Give me an example of where that would be useful to calculate in games, in any 3D game. Where do you need to know the cross product of two vectors in order to implement some operation? Hi? Huh? Yeah, give me an example of, like, okay, I'll give you a clue. First person shooter. Give me an example of a first person shooter where you absolutely have to calculate the cross product of two vectors to implement something. Huh? Walking. Now what am I doing? Strafing. Oh my god. What do I do? How do I strafe? What am I doing? I have a forward vector. I have the up vector. If I want to strafe, I need the I need the right vector or the left vector. Can you see that? So to go forward, I'm moving along in the look vector. Okay, and I have some global look vector, which is going to be 0, 1, 0. And then if I want to strafe, I need to know which direction the strafing is going in. If I'm looking in this direction, this is my forward vector, and I've got my up vector. If I want to strafe, I'm going to move sideways. Do you understand? So that vector has to be perpendicular to the up vector and the look vector, and that's called the right vector. Or you can call it the left vector as well, if it's going to be the left one. Here's an interesting thing. So first of all, yeah, the cross product gives you a vector which is mutually perpendicular. An interesting thing, um, and okay, you can do the calculation if you don't believe me, but maybe just have a guess at this. If if A is cross, if 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 we have A and B, A dot product with B, is that the same as B dot product with A or not? Same. It's the same. All right. So A dot product with B is the same as B dot product with A. What about A crossed with B? Is that the same as B crossed with A? You got it. It's not. It's not the same. If you get these two vectors here, and you can go and do the calculation if you don't believe me, but if you cross these vectors and you take A cross with B, you're going to get this vector. If you take B cross with A, you will get this vector. You'll get a vector which points in the opposite direction. So one way you get the right vector, the other way you're going to get the left vector. This has very important consequences, right? When we're calculating things, uh, this has a lot of consequences. And by the way, um, the order in which you pass things into the cross product, um, this also refers to the order in which vertices get passed to the graphics card, and it has a lot of significance, and it has a name. The order of vertices in the cross product, does anybody know what the name of that is called? How do you refer to the order of vertices? And if I was to say to you, when you calculate something and you write a program, and you're getting the wrong direction vector, I would say change the... Does anybody know what the term is? You might have read it in a games book. It's called the, the winding called the winding order of vertices, right? Is that going to be an exam? Huh? Is that going to be an exam? Um, no, but if you want to talk about this stuff, and I may, we maybe refer to it. You know, I'll talk about the winding order of vertices. I used to ask it when, uh, when we did vertex buffers in, in direct X years ago, but I don't get that low level anymore, so I, it's not so relevant. It's, it's a type of course that we have now, which kind of takes out some stuff and puts in other stuff. But it's called the winding order of vertices. It has total relevance, right? Because here's an interesting thing. Usually, um, computer games will, will do a thing called backface culling. Have you heard of that term? What does backface culling mean? Exactly. Yeah. If you specify a 3D model, right, of a cube or anything like this, you know, obviously, that cube has got two sides. I mean, it has a front side and a back side. All right, and you can draw both of them. You can draw the inside of the cube and the outside of the cube. But for optimization purposes, typically games will only draw one face, the outside of the face, and they don't draw the inside of the face because you never see it. It's all, it's, um, what's the word I'm looking for? It's um, when one thing is obscured by another, what's that called, that term? Occlusion. Occlusion, yeah. So the inside is occluded by the outside of that cube, right? So. Um, you can say only only draw the vertices one side, don't draw the other side, and that's determined by the winding order of the vertices. And if the vertices are wound one direction, like if you specify your vertices clockwise like this, it will draw this face, 
If you specify the same set of vertices but you specify them anti-clockwise, you will get the back face drawn, and that's um, not the front face. And then you can do stuff like, and I'll show you this in BGE, you can do stuff like turn on and turn off back face calling, where you can say call the front face, call the back face, or call the non. So that's, that's all to do with what's called a winding order of the vertices. Anyway, that's the cross product. You um, that per model? What's that? You said for individual for every model? Yeah, you could, if you really want to, but the, you typically in BGE it's just set back face calling, and all my vertices are specified in a winding order, which makes the front face get drawn on the back face, but it's very easy to turn the, um, the culling the other way. You'll see the inside of the models rather than the outside. I'll show you what it looks like. Is that the thing that slows down MMOs and stuff? Because they have to because there's loads of people looking at them, so it has to be real probably. Not really, not really, but it will obviously double the, not quite double, but it will make your rendering slower if you have no culling turned on. And it's typically a thing that people, when they're learning OpenGL, first of all, they turn culling off if they're programming vertex buffers by hand. What's a vertex buffer, by the way? I've mentioned that term a few times, a vertex buffer. And what's a vertex? So first of all, what's a vertex? It's a line. What's that? It's a line. It's a point. It's a point in 3D space. Okay, a vertex is usually not just a point in 3D space. A point in 3D space actually has another term. It's a point in 3D space. No. A point or a... Coordinate, yeah, could be coordinate. Coordinate is usually uh, is one term for it. What do we call it? points in 3D space? When they're rendered as points, what do we call them? Anyone play Minecraft? Yeah. What's the thing about Minecraft? What does it use for rendering? Voxels. Voxels. Right, so a voxel is a 3D point, right? Um, a vertex is a 3D point which forms what? Corner of a triangle, yeah, definitely. So when I say there's three vertices, I'm talking about the three corners of a triangle usually. So I've got vertex, vertex, vertex. And a vertex buffer then, what's a vertex buffer? Where you keep a list of them. Exactly, this is a block of memory that stores the vertices. Okay, um, yeah, I'll just show you this in VGE, right? You might have seen this already. Here's just. Um, I shouldn't have run it in the debugger. It doesn't matter. There you go. That's with um, back face calling turned off. Or one of the faces basically getting called. And that's that one. And if I go and run it again, there's actually a properties file that you can edit which changes the calling. If I look at the main.cpp, first of all, I think it's probably just the default properties. And you look here that there's a property here which says culling equals back. You can say culling equals front. In which case it will cull the opposite sides. And basically you'll see the inside of everything getting drawn as opposed to the outside of it. So you can see things like that. Yeah, that guy still looks pretty cool. But he's, yeah, essentially the insides of those shapes are getting drawn. The insides of those shapes are getting drawn and the outsides are not getting drawn. So the inside of being drawn, are you looking at You're looking at the thing inside. You're looking at the bottom of the thing that's being drawn. Yeah, you're not seeing the near side. Yeah. That's yeah, that's just how graphics work. <laughs> <work. laughs> so, um, yeah, what determines that basically is what's called the winding order of the vertices. Okay, so the cross product. Yeah, here's a question for you then, right? Just to make sure that you're clear on how the cross product works, and then we'll take a short break and we'll come back and talk about matrices and the rendering pipeline. Um, a very important calculation in, in graphics, right? just to illustrate maybe one of the applications for the cross product, is to calculate what's called a surface normal. So a surface normal, basically, if I take, you know, I'm sure you know, uh, maybe you don't know this, but I'll just double check to make sure everybody knows. You know the 3D graphics in a graphics card, um, you specify the vertices for a whole lot of triangles, and your thing gets drawn as a lot of triangles. You know that, don't you? Well, I presume everybody knows that. Like when you look at a 3D model, you're actually just creating loads and loads and loads of triangles, and they're all linked up together. You know that, I guess, right? Does everybody know that? Or did you know that? 
Well, maybe you didn't know that. Sorry, I should have said, right? When you're loading a 3D model, you know, it's basically specified as um, a whole lot of triangles. Okay? That's, that's it, right? One of the things that needs to be done is we want to shade that triangle. So what I need to do is I need to take the light source in the scene, so it could be the sun, right? And then I have all these triangles, and I want to shade them based on, you know, obviously the things that are facing away from the sun, they need to be um, shaded darker than things that are facing towards the sun. And this, by the way, is, is part of what's called the standard lighting model. And the standard lighting model, um, it's, this is also called um, a diffuse lighting. And this makes use of these vector calculations. So the first thing that I need to do is like, I need to calculate what's called the surface normal. So the surface normal is going to be the direction vector for this triangle. So if the triangle was like that, the direction vector for the triangle is going to be perpendicular to the triangle plane. So that's the plane there. Or if I had something like this, and I had um, my surface normal. My surface normal is basically, that's my triangle. And you can see that the surface normal is basically perpendicular to the triangle. Can everybody kind of see that? It sticks out from the triangle like this. How would I calculate that? Given that I have three vertices, A, B, and C. Well, I'll let you have a think about it, right? You can work it out yourselves there. <laughs> okay. Um, so just to wrap that last one up then, uh, because I didn't video that bit, just to say that in order to calculate the surface normal, you just pick any two sides of the triangle. So to calculate any one of the sides of the triangle, I could take basically C minus A and B minus A, and C minus A is going to give me that vector, and B minus A is going to give me that vector, the vector that I add to B to get to A, and then I cross the product of those two, and that will give me a vector that points out. So any two sides of the triangle, you subtract, you know, just any two sides, and you will get um, the surface normal. So a couple of other things that the cross product is used for, if you take, um, now normally I have a little spaceship model, but I think I must have brought it home over the summer to play with. So I don't have it with me anymore, so I'm going to bring it with me next week, okay? But I do have this very expensive prop here, which you can see, and I'll show you two other uses for the cross product. Method number one is to calculate, or thing number one is to calculate torque. Have you heard of torque? What's torque mean? Yeah, you got it. It's to do with turning. So it's a rotational force, right? Torque is also is always calculated around the axis of rotation. So if I want this car to drive forward, then I have to apply the torque in this axis here. So I can take the up vector, the direction in which I want it to move, and get the axis around which I need to do the torque. All right, so that's another thing that the cross product is used for. It's used to calculate the torque. And um, the third thing that it's used for is to calculate an angle of rotation. So I don't have my spaceship model, but maybe I'll just use the car, right? In 2D, okay, imagine that I'm looking down from the top in 2D and I'm doing like a 2D style game, the axis of rotation never changes. I can only ever rotate around one axis, which is basically the axis that points out of the screen. You now you imagine my tank, for example, my tank is like this. You know, there's only one axis. I can only rotate around one axis because it's 2D. Does everybody understand that? In 3D though, however, there's an infinite number of axis of rotations, aren't there? So like I can take this little um, car here and I can rotate it like this, in which case I'm rotating around this vector here. Can you see that? Uh, similarly, like I could do sideways like this, in which case this is the axis of rotation. So if I was to say in a, a game, if I have, um, and imagine this is a 3D type situation here, right, where I have some vector A, I have some vector B, A is currently looking in this direction, and I want to get it to look at this direction here. And this being 3D, I need to know two things. I need to know what's the angle here, which I can use. How do I calculate that? What tool will I use for my bag of tools? I will use the, yet to calculate that, I will use the dot product of the look vector and B minus A vector. So that gives me the angle, okay? So the inverse cosine of the dot product. Side. What's that? So I have to be the one to look at that. Yeah, actually, here's a way of thinking about this, right? If this is slightly confusing to you, I find this quite easy, right? Uh, I found this kind of helpful when I was thinking about this at the very start, right? The angle I want to calculate is theta. Um, when I do the dot product, I'm always getting the angle between two vectors relative to 0, 0, 0, okay? relative to the origin. So if I was to take A and B and get the dot product, this is the vector that I'm going to get here, or this is the angle I'm going to get here. 
It's a useless angle. It's no good to us. Maybe a better way to think about it would be to bring the whole problem to the origin, and then it becomes something we can solve using the dot product. So if I bring this to the origin, say I bring A to the origin, okay, then that still points out that way, and then B is kind of going to be up here, isn't it? And then I can get the dot product. You see, I can get the dot product to solve it. I find that's quite a, a helpful way to think about it. So the interesting question here is this look vector is a normal vector and it's always relative to the position of A, so that doesn't ever change. If I bring A to the origin, the look vector stays the same, doesn't it? Because it's relative to the A position. Is that okay with everybody? The B vector, though, is changing and the A vector is changing. The A vector changes to 0, 0, 0, doesn't it? And the B vector changes by the same amount. So if A goes from A to 0, then B has to also go from B, you have to subtract A from it as well. Because A minus A is 0, so I've basically subtracted A from itself, and then I have to subtract B from A, and that's, that's where I get my B minus A vector. So the vectors that I've used, that's the vector B minus A, and the look vector doesn't change. So I find that's kind of a helpful way to think about why you have to do B minus A to calculate that angle. So imagine I'm just bringing A to the origin, and I have to bring B by the same amount. So if I bring A to the origin, I've subtracted A from itself, and then to bring B by the same amount, I've also got to subtract A from B. Does that make sense? Does that help? But anyway, in this problem here, I can use this dot product to calculate the angle here. But then I need to know around which axis I'm performing the rotation, and I'm going to use the... In this example, it's probably going to be the Z, yeah, but it may not be. Like, similarly, you know, imagine my spaceship or my car. So say I want to rotate around this axis, I have to calculate the axis of rotation. So I will use the what mathematical tool to calculate the axis. The the cross product. The cross product will give me the axis of rotation. If I take this look vector and I take the b minus a vector and I cross them, I'll get this here, which is the axis of rotation. Does everybody see that? So that's another use for the cross product: calculating axis of rotation, um, calculating surface normals, uh, calculating a right vector in order to do a strafe, calculating the up vector, keeping everything aligned. We'll use the cross products. So there's lots of applications for the cross product. Okay. Um, the next thing then that we need to talk about is matrices, right? If you read the blog post, it goes from vectors and it explains why matrices work. I'm not going to bother doing that. I'm just going to skip all of that bit and we're just going to get straight into matrices and just say that there are another mathematical tool which are required in order to implement anything in, in games and graphics, right? But I'm not going to explain why they work. If you want, you can read the blog post and it explains why matrices work. The same thing when we do quaternions. I'm not going to explain why quaternions work, so it would be too long and it's not a maths course. It's a games programming course, so I'll just give you the tools. And if you want to look it up, there's plenty of Khan Academy videos you can watch and you can read the blog post and you can find you know, the physics programming book or read the maths book or ask a maths lecture or something. So, what is a matrix? First question. What is a matrix? The thing Neil's looking Huh? <laughs> what? The thing Neil's looking Yes. Yes, of course, it is that. But what else is a matrix? Is it a 2D array? It's a 2D array. Basically a 2D array. Great, and I'm glad you're thinking about matrices in terms of like, that's what a programmer would say a matrix is. It's a 2D array. What's the significance of it? Like, if I was to put up these on the board, if I pick that one, 0, 1, 1, 0, 5. Is that a matrix? No, no, no. no. Why? It's going to be missing an element. Yeah, we're missing an element. So the number of rows has to be the same for all of the columns, and the number of columns has to be the same for all of the rows. So it has a certain number of rows and a certain number of columns, right? In 3D graphics, we deal exclusively with two types of matrices. Well, hang on, almost exclusively. There are a couple of minor exceptions, but we deal with matrices which are four rows and four columns because any transformation we want to do can be encapsulated into a four by four matrix. And we also deal with these type of matrices which are with uh, four, uh, one column and four rows. Okay, they're the two types of matrices that we deal with and we don't, we're not really interested. Very occasionally we might have to do a three by three matrix. We have, we need to do that for physics calculations. But Typically it's 4 by 4, uh, 4 multiplied by 4, and then this is, um, we always specify these as rows multiplied by columns, and this basically is um, a 4 row multiplied by 1 column, so this is rows multiplied by columns as well. 
You should probably take a couple of notes at this point, right? So these are the two type of matrices that we deal with when we're dealing with graphics. Um, occasionally, we have to deal with, um, depending on the type of the graphics part, this is the way OpenGL matrices work. DirectX matrices work um, slightly differently in that we have um, these ones, but I also have these ones, which are basically, um, these are one by four. In other words, one row and four columns. Okay, that, they're the direct X ones, but OpenGL matrices are um, four rows and one column matrix, okay? Right, the operations that we can do on matrices, we can add them, subtract them, multiply by a scalar, all of that stuff we'll never do. The only thing we need to do with matrices is two things. We need to multiply four by four matrices with other four by four matrices, and sometimes we need to, but a lot of the times we need to multiply four by four matrices with, what do we call these again? One by four or four by four? Four, four by four. four, four. These are four by one matrices. So these are the only types of matrices we ever need to multiply together. And obviously, we never multiply them ourselves. We will use the operator overloading and write all this in C++, right? But just to be clear about how this works, can you guys remember how matrices are multiplied? You would have done them with me, and you probably would have done them with maths, your maths lecture as well. Let me throw up two four by four matrices and see if you can remember how they're multiplied, right? Save my picture. One, zero, one, minus one, eight, nine, three, four, five, six, seven, one, 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 zero. And I'll put another one up here, say eight, Minus one, minus one, minus one, minus one, minus one, nine, three, five, two, eight, four, five, minus one, minus one, zero. There's two four by four matrices. How do we multiply them? First, first question is: Are they multipliable? Can they be multiplied together? Yeah. Why do we know, or how do we know that they can be multiplied? What's the rule? Yeah, yeah, so if we have rows multiplied by columns and rows multiplied by columns here, then the number of columns in this matrix must be equal to the number of rows in this matrix. So that's how I can also multiply a 4 by 4 with a 4 by 1. Because that also is multipliable, right? Because this number matches with this number. And then the answer, how many rows and columns will it have? And how would I know? Uh, yeah, exactly. So we take the rows in this one, and we take the columns in this one, and that determines the size of the resulting matrix. So when I multiply those together, I am going to get another four by four. All right. So this is going to have rows from the first one multiplied by columns in the second one, and we'll get a four by four matrix on the other side. Just to be clear that everybody knows how those matrices are multiplied, would you just on paper? Just multiply those matrices out. Just take the first couple of rows of the matrix, just to make sure that you remember how it works. Yeah, just work together on, in groups of two. If you, if you can't remember, ask the person sitting beside you. Uh, quite tricky to do these by hand, they're very error prone, so we will always have computer programmers to do it. That's what they're good at. By the way, if you want to know what a graphics card does, what they talk about rendering pipelines and pipelines on a graphics card, graphics card, all it's doing is doing loads and loads and loads of matrix multiplication is very quickly. That's what a graphics card does. Better graphics card. The more, the the more matrices you, you can multiply together at the same time in parallel. What does the matrix do? We'll get to that. Just so long as I want, I want just everybody to um, essentially we'll use matrices to take something from local space like a 3D model and then we'll render it relative to the camera and that's called view space. Or we'll render it relative to everything else which is called world space and then we'll transform it relative to the camera which is called view space and then we'll rasterize it and that's called that projection. So we'll take a 3D thing and make it into a 2D thing that we'll multiply it by a series of matrices. And that's what graphics cards do. They take obviously the vertices in local space and end up rendering them on the screen, and that's just multiplying each vertex by its own matrices. Kind of
Yeah. Uh, first column, third row, is that at five? I'm um, sorry, of the second of the second menu. Yeah. You clear up your fours and nines as well. Right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my nines are like that, and my fours are like that. Well, there you go. That's a nine. That's not a nine, right? This, this is a nine. staple. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Yeah, that's not a nine. Are you going to criticize my handwriting too? It wasn't me, you too. Constructive criticism. It's not me. I welcome criticism. You're a lot of regrets. No, no, quite, quite the opposite. I want to, uh, I want to constructive. I want everyone to feel like they can contribute to the voice. Oh, really? Yeah. Without any fear. <laughs> Say what you like in this class. There's no stupid questions or no, put it on Facebook, please do. No, I'm on Facebook a lot of the time, so I mean it's just it's either running on my computer if I'm watching movies or whatever, so just like, you know, put it on Facebook, okay? Similarly, everybody, the Facebook page is very quiet. I guess once the um, assignments and stuff kick off, you might start posting stuff. But if you've got any questions or any que you know things you want to share or any questions, you can't get something working in the lab, just post it on the Facebook page and I'll pretty much pick those straight away. That's what it's for. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Is your Mac very slow? Is my Mac very slow? It's in 3D. Like everybody like this. No, it's okay. Why? It's yours? My download is Unreal. Oh, Unreal, forget it. You won't run it. <laughs> yeah, no. Play me with it. It's only 10. Uh, I know. They're, 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 shit. they're just shiny and silver, and they got that nice apple thing on the outside, which means you'd be dumb to the price. How old was that one? Oh, okay, yeah. It's not a No, I mean, it'll get you through. I think if you want to do a project, you're better off with Unity, because Unity will run on anything. Unreal requires a very high like, set Look, I, I can't really run it successfully with this one. Can you not uh, 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 Unity, Unity, yeah. Unity's perfect. Uh, do you have a fixed moment with A couple of days. Uh, like a couple of months, probably. Yeah. If you don't need to get anything you need this time at Christmas. We're going down. So, like, I'd work around. What do you need? We have loads of them, so you should get them loads of them. Yeah. Brian, did you submit mine when I gave them? Yes, I did. I submitted all of them, yeah. When was that? Uh, like weeks ago. When I spoke yeah. to Paul Doyle about it. But I'll chase him up next week, yeah. right? Susan said we're supposed to hear in the first week if they yeah. can do it, if they can. Yeah, just to get some sort of feedback. Yeah, no problem. Like I'll, I'll, yes. I'll chase you up on Monday. Doyle, Paul Doyle has approved all this stuff in principle, so yeah. we just have to find a mechanism. But like, it'll be done, okay? So I, I'll make sure it's done. Cool. But um, you know, work around it. We turn your steering wheel should be no problem. Yeah, because we can get a DIT supplier for that. The Rift stuff is a bit more tricky because I need a DIT credit card. Mm -hmm. I'm still video videoing. I forgot to turn it off. So, anyway. So you get in the hang of these, we take this row by this column. So we've got 1 by 8, 0 by minus 1. Uh, so 1 by 8 is 8, uh, that's 0. Once 5 is 5, so that's 13. Uh, minus 5 is going to be 8. Is that correct for the first two? Yeah. So, you guys need to check. This is very error yeah. prone. Huh? Right. Yeah. Let's do the next cell across, right? So that one we take <laughs> this row by this column. So I've got uh, minus 1, 0. 2, which brings you to plus 1, minus 1 by minus 1 is uh, plus 1, so 3. Yep. Yep. Yeah. 2. Huh? 2. I'll do it again, right? Um, so that's uh, 0, sorry, minus 1, 0, 2. So that's minus 1 plus 2 is plus 1, and then minus 1 by minus 1 is plus 1, so 3. Two. No, it's two. Sorry, two. 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 Two.
to mute again. <laughs> uh, minus one, zero, two. So that brings you up to plus one. And then plus one. Plus one is two. Yeah, very good. <laughs> so we've discovered that Brian doesn't know that one and one is two. Brian thinks one and one is three. Just yeah, I've tried to So by all means, feel free to criticize. I've tried to remember that, right? Yeah. So then we have one minus one, that's minus one, uh, zero, and then we have eight. So we've got minus one plus eight is um, seven. Minus one times minus one is one, so we get eight. Correct? Yeah. And then we'll do the last one. One minus one is minus one, zero, four, so that brings it to three. Three. Okay, we'll just do the second row, otherwise, so just to get the point, 88 to 64, and then that's uh, minus 9, so that's going to bring me to 55, um, yeah? Yeah. yeah. Um, plus 5 is 60, uh, 70. Yeah. And so on. <laughs> so, uh, you guys get the idea. What, what have we learned from that? Brian, did, should you not move over a, a column when you What's multiply that? the second row? What's that? Should you not move over a column when you multiply the second row there? So, so what I'm doing second. here, um, to get this cell here, yeah. I take the second row by the first column. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then to get the next cell here, I take the second row by the second column. Right. Okay. okay, that's how the matrix multiplication works. Mm -hmm. You guys might remember, you wrote this in uh, C Sharp in second year. So, um, yeah, that's how matrix multiplication works, right? These are the type of matrices that we multiply. We've got one other type, which is this type of matrix here. And if we take this matrix by this matrix, we get a matrix which is going to have um, four rows and one column. And then the big question, of course, which I'm sure you're all asking is, no, that's okay, <laughs> that's easy, that's just the same rule. The big question I'm sure you're asking is, why? Why are you wrecking our brains with this matrix multiplication? Why? 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 And um, the answer is, and you know what, I might fire up the slides for this, or maybe I'll just um, explain. The, yeah, you know what, I'll fire up the slides for this, because it just will take too long to write out. So the answer is, that you can do any transformation by making use of the matrix. By the way, you all know that these notes are there on the website as well, yeah? yeah. This is a full set of course notes, which I'm updating week by week. It's you. Yeah. 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 Okay. So, um, yeah, a couple of interesting matrices. What about this matrix here? 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1. What do we call that one? You missed More or less? You missed a row. We call that the identity matrix. Why is it called the identity matrix? Because it's equivalent to one. Yes, it's equivalent to multiplying by one. If you multiply any matrix by any form or form matrix or whatever, it doesn't change the matrix. It's called the identity matrix. Okay. Um, and here we go. We're loads of matrix: addition, subtraction. None of the same. This is the only thing that we do. Yeah. So the three types of transformations that we need to do are called translations. What's a translation? I have to translate you from there over to there, one way I've done. Yeah, translation is a movement, okay? So any kind of movement we can encapsulate by multiplying um, the matrix by a vector. Um, we can do a rotation around any axis by multiplying a vector by a matrix. And we can multiply, we can do a scaling. So these are the three types of transformations we're interested in. We're interested in moving things, rotating things, and scaling them, making them bigger or smaller. So all of these can be encapsulated in different shaped matrices, right? And here's an example of some of the matrices. A translation matrix in OpenGL looks like this. Can I start the slideshow from here? Where is the slide? Okay. 
Yeah, so that's what a translation matrix looks like. The diagrams are coming in. Oh, here we go. Yeah, so this is what a translation matrix looks like, right? Translation matrix looks like this. It's almost like the identity matrix. But we put the x, y, and z components by which we want to translate something into this last um, column of the matrix. And that's what a translation matrix looks like. If I was to take this matrix, um, and I multiply this by a 4 by 1 matrix on the other side, I'm going to get a 4 by 1 matrix, which is the equivalent of the vector version of this matrix translated by x, y, and z. So the first thing is, um, if I want to multiply this matrix by a vector, a vector only has three components in it. The 3D vectors only have three components, right? So you have to make an extra component here at the end. Okay, so you add either a 0 or 1 to the last element of this. The x, y, and z components of the thing you're multiplying this matrix by are going to be the x, y, and z components of the vector. The last component here is going to be either 0 or 1. Why either? So this, if you use one, because basically, if you use one as the last uh, component here, if you use zero as the last component here, it, essentially all of these multiplied by things end up being zeroed. So it doesn't do this last bit of this multiplication if you make zero the last component here. You can work it out, you can see that. You multiply this by this and so on, you end up with a zero here. It basically just means zero by x, zero by y, zero by z, zero by one. So it doesn't affect it. When you set the last component here to be zero, it presumes that you are only doing this part of the matrix and not this part of the matrix. And the interesting thing is this part of the matrix here is going to be the translation bit. Inside here is going to be the rotation and the scaling bit. In fact, I'm not even sure about the scaling bit. I'd like to come back to that. Maybe the scaling bit is actually the last bit as well. Because I'm pretty sure if you specify zero as the last bit, it will just do the rotation bit. And if you specify a 1 here as your last component, it will do the translation and all the rest of the matrix as well. Um, so in, in terms of GLM, right, this is how you make a translation matrix. Okay? What this you, you use this API call here, GLM call call map 4 is the type. Alright, that's a 4 by 4 matrix. So M is a 4 by 4 matrix, and you go GLM call call and translate. And this takes two parameters. You might wonder why does it take two parameters? The second parameter here is the most important one. This is the position that you want to translate by. And what it will end up doing is creating this matrix like this. It will take the position x, y, and z and put them in as this component of the matrix. The first parameter here, in this case, GLM column column map 4 would. I have no idea what that's going to be. Why would you need an extra parameter? Is that for the 1 to 0? Yeah, in actual fact, GLM column column map 4 1 will give you the identity matrix. Okay, that's how you make the identity matrix. So the first parameter is the identity matrix, and the second parameter is the position. The first parameter doesn't have to be the identity matrix. The first parameter is just a matrix that you want to add some translation components into. So you can combine matrices together, but typically to keep things simple, I always pass the identity matrix as the first parameter, and then I pass the second parameter as being the position that I want to control the rotate by. But I think you don't have to do it like that. You can pass any matrix in here, and it will basically just do the translation bit to the matrix that you pass in here. Right? But I always pass the identity in here. Do you do like a matrix equal to that? Or how do you get yeah, that? M equals GLM colon colon translate. Sorry, sorry, yes. No worries, no worries. So you just go M equals that, and that makes you the matrix. Okay? So that's how you make a translation matrix. Can you do that for um, 2D objects as well? You just substitute the Z for the zero? Probably. And the issue is that, yeah, of course, you've no Z component. Yeah. Yeah, I'm you probably can. I think you probably can. Yeah. Um, so, rotation matrices are the same kind of thing. But rotation matrices are not, I don't think I even put it up on the screen, you know, but like you can do the derivation of this. Like, and if you look at that blog post, it does 2D rotation matrices. matrices and shows you where the elements are set. But it's basically some of them are sine the angle, some of them are cosine the angle, and so on. But we don't care. Okay? As programmers, all we care is there's a thing called a rotation matrix that if I multiply a vector by it, it has the effect of rotating that vector. Okay? And to make one, you go rot matrix, GLM is map 4 as well, and you go GLM colon colon rotate. You pass in the first parameter, this is the matrix you want to rotate. I always pass in the identity, even though you could pass in a translation matrix and it would rotate 
It would add rotation components into that tra translation matrix. The second parameter here is the angle of rotation. And then the third parameter is the axis of rotation. Next question. This uh, thing here is going to be degrees or radians? Uh, that could be either. I think it's radians, but I'll need to just double check my code. Some of these parameters take degrees and some of them take um, radians. It's a bit of a, you need to know which one is which, but I'm pretty sure this one is radians. And then this one is the axis of rotation. So the axis of rotation here is going to be the it's the y axis. It's straight up. So this is what we call in terms of um, in terms of rotations, this is a special rotation. What's it called? Anybody know? This type of rotation is called a yaw. It's called a yaw. So a rotation around the, uh, the, the up vector, or the global up vector, whatever is called a yaw rotation. So you imagine an airplane, right? When an airplane goes like this, that's called yaw. All right? When an airplane goes down and up like this, that's called pitch. And then when an airplane goes like this, that's called roll. Roll. So that's yaw, pitch, and roll. Yaw is a rotation around the y-axis. Pitch is a rotation around the x-axis. And then roll is a rotation around the z-axis. And of course, this is just if your object is, 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 is these are its, its, its vectors. You know, your, your object could be like this. So in other words, like if you imagine that that's the x, that's the z-axis, yeah, the y-axis and the x-axis. You know, now I'm not lo no longer rotating around the actual axis of the world. I'm rotating around my own look vector. You know what I mean? Because my look vector would start out being the z-axis and then it changes. So that's what a rotation vector looks like, and that's the special rotations. And then scaling matrix. You can make a scaling matrix like by the following thing here. You go GLM, call it, call it scale. You pass in the matrix you want to add scaling to, and then the second parameter here, it's a vector. Okay, and you specify how many units on the x-axis for the x-axis scaling, the y-axis scaling, and the z-axis scaling, and that will make the scaling matrix. Now, typically in a game, um, we're going to need to do this to we're going to need to combine these transformations together, right? And the cool thing about matrices is that combining these transformations is as simple as, what would you think? Multiplying those matrices together. All right? So the interesting thing is, if I have some 3D object in my scene like this, and if I take a simple 3D object like this and I make it up out of triangles, you know, each face is going to have one, two, three, four, five, six triangles, or six vertices, right? And then I have six vertices here, so I've got one, two, three, four, five, six faces. So I've got 36 vertices. If I want to translate, rotate, and scale all of those, I don't want to have to take 36 vertices and multiply by three matrices. I can multiply the three matrices together to make a combined transformation matrix. And then I can multiply one matrix by each of these, and it will have the effect of translating, rotating, and scaling at the same time, every operation. Does everybody understand that? Now, one very important point, right? If I multiply my matrices together, does the order matter? If I translate, rotate, and scale, does the order matter? Yeah. Absolutely it matters, right? And we don't have time to do it today, but next week I'll show you exactly why it matters. Um, why it matters is if you, for example, which should you do first? Imagine you've got a computer game. Which, which, which do you want to do first? Say I want to put my character into the scene. Like, which order should I do them? Translation, rotation, scaling, or does it matter? Translate, rotation, then rotate, and scale probably doesn't matter as much. Okay, so you think you should translate first? Yeah, so I'd really like, love to do this now, but it's 5 to 5. Okay, let's do it. Right, I need a couple of volunteers. Come on up. Keith, you're volunteer number one. Cool, cool. This will literally take 10 minutes, if not, if even that. And it will be worth it. Right, Mark, you can come up with volunteer number two. Okay? <laughs> Everybody see what I have here? I have a pen. I'm going to draw on the floor. That is the origin, right? That's the center. And here's the x-axis. So that's the positive x-axis. That's the negative z-axis. That's the positive, that's the negative x-axis. And this is the positive z-axis. So that means the y is actually pointing up like this. 
So everybody just be clear about what way these axes work. I'm doing these because this is where I'm standing. That's positive x, negative x, positive z, negative z, positive y axis. Are we okay with that? And let's say steps are units, right? So Keith, you go first, okay? So let's do two operations. Let's do a rotation and a translation. Sorry, a rotation and a um, translation. Yeah, cool. They're simple ones to do, and they're really easy to demonstrate this principle. Keith, here's the two operations that we want you to do, okay? Let's say, first of all, I'm going to move you uh, three units on the x. Two units on the y and minus one unit on the z, and then I want you to perform a 90 degree rotation around the uh, y axis. We'll keep it simple. Okay, so you start at the origin, right? Start at the origin, and then you're moving three on the x. So move three on the x first. One, two, three, and then two on the y. <coughs> <laughs> So here's your y-axis, right? So you can move two steps onto the y-axis. No, stand, stand up on the y-axis. So you're two on the y-axis, and then minus one on the z. So you're going to move your chair back one. Now I want you to rotate 90 degrees around the y-axis. So you guys, help Keith. Where does he move to when he moves 90 degrees around the y-axis? So first of all, the rotations are clockwise or counterclockwise? It open GL or counterclockwise? Yeah, so. huh? So you're going to move counterclockwise, right? You're here, and you want to move 90 degrees around the y-axis. So 90 degrees around the y-axis, counterclockwise. Let me just think for a second. This direction is clockwise. This direction is counterclockwise. Yeah. So where do you move to, roughly? Okay. Anyone want to correct him? Where does he move to? 90 degrees counterclockwise. Anyone want to correct? Do you, do you draw the y-axis? Y-axis is up, right? Huh? It doesn't matter. Just do a 90 degree rotation around the y-axis. Try, try again, try again. No, okay, so Keith, somebody help Keith. Where does he move to? Or where, what happens? Huh? Yeah, the y-axis is this way, and you're moving around the y-axis. So what happens? Try again. Look at the way. Counterclockwise. To me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, you're almost correct, but you're wrong. <laughs> you're wrong because you're not rotating around the... Axis. No, you're rotating around the axis, but you're not rotating around the... All rotations are around the... He's rotating around his own They're axis. around the origin. When you rotate, you are always rotating around the origin. You can't say rotate around your current position. That's a different rotation. That's rotation around a position. You can't rotate around a position. You're always rotating around the origin. Your position is this, and you are rotating your position. When you so rotate your position, you end up being over here somewhere. Yes, the bring himself around. No, no, counterclockwise, this way, yeah. So yeah. I start off that way. We go that way. So here, here. Give your hand. No mark. Stand up there. Stand up, Keith. Stand up on the chair there, right? Do this. Yeah, Mark, you stand the other side there, will you? Stand the other side here, right? I'm going to rotate you. <laughs> this way, this way. <laughs> <laughs> you are rotating around here. Does everybody see that? That's your rotation. Does everybody understand? You're always rotating this. No, no, you're rotating around the origin. That's your old position. So you rotate 90 degrees and you end up somewhere over there. So it's like radius based off his position to it. And it's, going, it's the radius based off his position to the origin moving in a circle around it, is it? You are always like that. When, when I'm saying rotate around, you know, that's your position. Your position is rotating. Your position is rotating. Like Does everybody understand that? Like a so, huh? Like a compass. Direction. Like a compass. You are always rotating around the origin. Position always rotates around the origin. So, anyway, back you go. Stand up in your position, please. Thank you. Mark, yes. stand at the origin, please. And we'll do the rotations in the opposite direction. So, first of all, 90 degree rotation around the y axis. Um, yeah. No, yeah. rotate around the origin. Rotate. That's it. Perfect. Now, translate by three units on the x. That's the z. The x is that axis over there. One, two, three. Two units on the y. There you go. And then minus one on the z, so you move back here. Never mind. Stand back there. There we go. 
But now, the question we have to ask ourselves after all of that, are Mark and Keith the same? No. What have we learned? You wrote the quotation first. first. Yeah. Well, the, the, the most important thing that we've learned is the order in which you do these transformations determines the final outcome. So you, you can't say a rotation followed by a translation is the same as a translation followed by a rotation. They're completely different. That's not the opposite because it's not the opposite to be over there. No? Huh? <laughs> <laughs> no, not Keith. Either way, this, this won't work. What's that? It, this, this, this won't work because um, this will only work for your first rotation of an object. Any subsequent rotation you do is going to be around the origin and you'll be far away from the origin. So it's actually not useful for a Great question, great point. So, if I do want to rotate Keith around the origin, how would I do it? It's obvious. Normalize it? No. Okay, but maybe the answer is in the question. If I want to rotate Keith around the origin, what do I do? I push him back to the origin, I do the rotation, and then I do the translation. You want to rotate around yourself. You have to always rotate around the origin, and then you move back to where you want to go. So, I actually thought that was called normalizing. Yeah, normalizing just means making a vector of unit length. So what's the order then? The order depends completely on what you want to achieve, but I would think typically rotation and scaling first followed by translation. But we'll, we'll write some programs next week, right?